Please open your Bibles with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, it's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew 27, and we're going to be looking at verses 45 to 56. And if you didn't bring a Bible, there's a Bible in the rack in front of you, and it's on page 834. If you brought your phone or your iPad, it's uh, in new version, Matthew 27. The nice thing about an iPad is you can kind of make it bigger. So as your eyes get worse, you can have bigger print. It's a great thing. Please don't look at your email while we're <laughs> going through. But Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. And, uh, you know, while we're looking it up there, let me remind you that next Sunday's Palm Sunday and Palm Sunday weekend. And we've got a great Sunday prepared. We've got children singing, and we're going to have people being baptized. They're going to share their faith story. We're going to put a tank right up here, and we're going to dunk them. So you want to be a part of that. So come next Sunday. And then the following week, on Good Friday, we've got a Good Friday service. And we'll be talking about Jesus in the Last Supper, talking to his disciples and what that means for us. And then on Saturday morning, a bunch of us are going to hold crosses and stand at street corners all over the southwest side and just give out a message of hope to people. Saturday evening and Sunday morning, we'll have three Resurrection Day services. Next Sunday, we're going to have a little card, an invitation card that you can take with you to invite someone else to come. You know, a lot of people only come to church on Christmas and Easter. So this is a great way to talk to your neighbor or a coworker or someone at school and say, hey, why don't you come along with me next weekend to come to the Resurrection Day? And we're going to do our best to present the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly and pray that God would touch their hearts. So be praying with us about those things. Well, Matthew 27, verse 45 to 56, is Jesus on the cross breathing his last breath. And it talks about his death and what follows. As we read this, I want you to notice something. There are miracles that accompany the death of Jesus. Matthew points out, for instance, that darkness came over the land. We know it was not an eclipse. Some have suggested it was an eclipse. I don't think I've ever seen an eclipse last three hours. It's also full moon at Passover season because the uh, lunar calendar is what they use for developing ca- uh, Passover calendar. So we know that there are no eclipses during a full moon. It's a new moon. So darkness, a supernatural darkness, comes over the land from noon to 3 p.m. while Jesus is hanging on the cross. And then there's an earthquake, and some weird things happen. And then the final scene is we see these witnesses, the Roman soldiers and the women. And so as we read this, look for those things, the darkness, the earthquake, the witnesses. And I want you to think about what would it be like if you were there, one of the witnesses of Jesus' death? What would you be hearing? What would you be feeling? What impact would it make on you? Okay? Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, So it's about uh, noon to 3 p.m. And about the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see if Elijah will help save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and rocks were split. The tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. 
when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. That literally means they were scared to death. And they said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to understand the meaning of your cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the uh, nice things about teaching on this is that a lot of people today don't know the story of Easter. Um, A fellow was telling me that his daughter's employer gave her some money and said, I want you to take a bunch of your friends to see the movie The Son of God. Her employer evidently is a, a Christ follower and he wanted this high school student to have her friends see the movie. And so she took some of her friends to see the movie and halfway through the Son of God movie, one of her friends turned over, leaned over to her and he said, he's going to die, isn't he? She did not know the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. That's not uncommon in our city. There's a lot of people that don't know the story. I was with a group of pastors on Monday and Tuesday, which is really a weird experience. I don't know if you've ever had that happen, but I mean, being around pastors is just unique. That's all I can say. And and it is sometimes, you know, weird things come up. And, and you know, you hear sometimes you hear jokes, you know, how many pastors does it take to screw in a light bulb and everything. I just want you to know those are not jokes. Those those really, I mean, it's it's just a weird group. But we were sitting around talking, and one of the questions came up, what have you noticed that's changed in the past five years? And one of the pastors said he'd recently seen a report that said that up to 55% of the people sitting in our churches on Sunday mornings are agnostics. That means they don't believe in, they're not sure God exists, and if He does exist, they don't think He cares about them. 55%. And I thought, you mean to tell me on a Sunday morning as we're sitting here, over half of us would have doubts about whether God exists? Now, I think part of the reason for that, not only among people who go to church, but in our culture at large, is that the suffering of our world has made us think that maybe God isn't here. Uh, You know, our world is kind of messy. I was walking through my family room this week. I saw my mom's picture on the frame. My mom died in 2000, December 4th, 2000. She's been gone 14 years now. I I looked at my mom, and within me was this twinge of, oh, I wish she hadn't left us. And it's been 14 years. I thought, you know, I love my mom. I, I appreciated her so much. And I, I remember all of a sudden, I, it was a flashback to when she died and how hard it was to accept her death. Some things we just don't get over, do we? Some of us have chronic illnesses and they're not getting any better. We have a fellow in our church who has 15% efficiency in the pumping of his heart. It's supposed to be 50, 60%, which is normal. He's at 15. And he told me it's probably not going to get better. We never get over that. Some of, us, some of us have loved ones that are in serious, chronic conditions. I have a cousin who has serious cancer. And apart from a miracle from God, she's you know, 43 years old. And I think that even as Christ followers, when we see the suffering, we begin to wonder, is God really there? You know, we pray and things don't get better. We pray and someone we love dies. We pray and that chronic condition just keeps taking us down. 
And we think, is God there? And does God care? Now, I bring this up because Matthew 27 answers that question. Here in the death of Jesus, we see God dealing with human suffering and misery. We see God dealing with injustice. And just when Christ seems to be the weakest, his life ebbing away, screaming from the cross, we also see the power and reality of our God. One of the reasons we believe this is a true story really happened in time and space is because no one would describe the founder of a religious organization as someone so weak as the gospel writers present Jesus. One reason to believe it's true is because of the way they present Jesus and his weakness. And I'd like to look at these three things, the darkness, the earthquake, and the witnesses, and talk about what those things mean and what they mean for us. I think you're going to be encouraged if you're open to what God may be saying to us. Let's take, for instance, the darkness. The darkness comes over the land for three hours. Jesus has been hanging on the cross for, from about 9 a.m., but at noon, it really gets dark. It's a supernatural darkness. We know that darkness often implies the judgment of God on human sin and failing. Remember back in the days of the Exodus when God was delivering Israel and he brought a series of plagues on the Egyptian people and one was darkness. Darkness covered the land of Egypt, but it was light where the Israelites were. Now we know that God in part was bringing that darkness to expose the religious people of that day, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders and the Jewish people, that God's judgment was coming on them even as Christ was dying. You say, how do we know that? Well, hundreds of years before this event, the prophet Amos wrote these words. Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon. Hmm, how about that? And darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning. Passover's going on. And all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son. And the end of it like a bitter day. Isn't that interesting? Amos was saying the day will come when God's judgment will come upon religious people. However, that doesn't seem to be the main emphasis of the darkness. The main emphasis of the darkness seems to reflect the darkness Jesus felt in his own soul. As he's hanging on the cross, he literally screams. And what does he scream? Oh, my hands and my feet hurt. Driven nails through him. No, that's not what he screamed. Does he scream, Lord, all my friends have abandoned me. No, he didn't say that. Social loneliness. He didn't say, Lord, I just feel so lonely. No, this was not a psychological suffering. What did Jesus say? Well, we know from the way it's recorded in the Gospels that Jesus cried out what is known as the fourth word on the cross. If you've ever studied the last seven words of Jesus, you know that at this point on the cross, already Jesus has said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, describing the very people that are crucifying him. We also know that he said to the thief, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And we also know that he looked down at his mother and linked her with John, the beloved disciple, and John with his mother, taking care of his mom's needs. But at this point now, 
the fourth word comes out. Jesus literally screams, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the exact words of Psalm 22, verse 1. Let me read that for you. Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Jesus is in agony here. He feels forsaken from his Father. Now, some have tried to soften what he's feeling by saying maybe he just felt it, but God was really there. Others have used Psalm 22 and say if he was thinking about Psalm 22, well, the, that psalm goes into victory at the end. Maybe he was really think, speaking of victory. It seems the way Matthew presents it that this is a darkness that has invaded the very soul of Jesus as he suffers under the weight of human sin. We talked about that last week, how God has transferred all the sins of humankind upon his shoulders, and he died in our place. Under the weight, he is literally judged by his Father. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, it says in the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus is suffering, well, let's just call it what it is. He's suffering an infinite hell. Many scholars think that the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell, refers to this very moment. The infinite suffering of Jesus was an isolation that he experienced from the Father. Some people have talked about what rejection feels like. You know, if a friend rejects you, it's hurtful and painful, but we usually get out, you know, beyond that. But if your spouse rejects you, or your parents reject you, or your children reject you, that is something that is so painful we never get over it. Jesus has been linked to his father his whole life. He's spent full nights praying to his father. In line with the intimacy he has enjoyed with his heavenly father, he's been able to make decisions and to do spectacular supernatural miracles by the power of his father on the life of people. And now suddenly, my God my God, we cannot even imagine the torture and suffering. This is why a lot of writers call this Jesus' passion, the passion of the Christ. Now, the word passion we use in our Cedar Rapids context means romance, you know, romantic love. Um, it's candlelight, it's lipstick, it's Calvin Klein's passion perfume. Uh, but the word literally means, in its old sense, suffering. The passion of Christ is suffering love. Why do you think Jesus descended into darkness of hell and was so forsaken? You know, the passage goes on here to say that somebody felt compassion for him and thought he was calling for Elijah. Could be that Eli, Eli! Oh, he's calling for Elijah, not realizing that Jesus, you know, was trilingual. He knew Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And um, Eli, Eloi, as another gospel writer says it, is the shortened version of Elohim, which is God, my God, my God. But the bystander heard it and, and thought of Elijah. Maybe he was thinking of Malachi chapter 4, where it says that before the great and awesome day of the Lord, now uh, Elijah will come back. Maybe he was thinking of Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elijah is literally translated into heaven by chariots of fire. And maybe he was thinking, oh, Jesus is calling for Elijah to come and rescue him. Whatever thing he was thinking, we don't know for sure, he, he was drawn to give Jesus some sour wine. And Jesus moistened his lips. And we think it was at that point he was able to give his uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh words on the cross, which we know um, 
this word uh, was, I thirst from John 19, and, and then his vocal cords being opened, it is finished, and then into your hands I commit my spirit. Two loud cries. Why do you think Jesus said he was forsaken? Why did it happen? Have you ever thought of this verse from Ephesians chapter 5? Talking about husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved what? The church and gave himself up for her. What was Jesus passionate about on the cross? He was passionate about finishing his rescue mission because he had a suffering love for you and for me. The reason Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me, is because in the loneliness of that forsakenness, he wanted to finish the job. It is finished, he cried out, knowing that we would be rescued from our misery. The passion of the Christ is his passionate love for you and for me. Our God is no longer angry at us. He poured out his anger on his own son on the cross. Now he smiles at us because of what Jesus did. And what brings a smile to the Jesus face is knowing that his forsakenness led to our acceptance. You see, you wonder whether God exists when you go through suffering. Jesus entered this world and walked on our streets to enter and embrace the suffering we feel. Jesus hung on that cross and experienced a suffering far greater than we experience to prove that God is here. He has not abandoned us. In fact, Jesus' very prayer is a prayer of faith. Look at it again. My God, my God. He's not saying, hey, crowd, I've given up on God. No, he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even his cry is a cry of faith. Do you see that? So often we feel as if God is not there when we suffer, and so therefore God is not there. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just because we don't feel his, he's not there does not mean he isn't there. He is. And Jesus gave us not only this great substitutionary sacrifice, but he showed us the better way. When you endure suffering, look at the cross and see Jesus there. The agonizing isolation is the passion of suffering love for you, for me. I mean, we ought to put seatbelts on when we come into this worship center because when we come to terms with the reality of who God is and what He's done for us, we want to just jump up and shout. You're so calm. Because you know what? what the amazing thing is here that it, as He breathes His last, as He feels most weak, there's an earthquake. It's almost as if God says, okay, now I want to tell you the significance of what my son just did. And this earthquake breaks out. And what happens? Well, simultaneously with the earthquake, the curtain in the temple is torn. You know, we have to think about this because in Judaism of that day, temple worship had lots of barriers. Let's say you're a Gentile, which most of us are. You would be, you'd have your little courtyard of the Gentiles, but you couldn't go beyond to worship God. You had to stay in your little court. There's a barrier. If you were a Jewish woman, there was a courtyard for you, but you couldn't go any further. There was a barrier. If you were a Jewish man, you could get into the holy place and worship God. 
but you could not go into the Holy of Holies. There was a barrier. Uh, we have a picture here. Some believe that one of the curtains, uh, I'm not sure which curtain this was, but was 60 to 80 feet in height. The Holy of Holies was a place that the high priest only could go once a year during Passover. He would take the blood of a lamb about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and he would sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, which was the mercy seat under the seraphim, and it would symbolize the shedding of blood for the sins of the Jewish people. The high priest could go in once a year. We've heard extra-biblical sources say they may have tied a rope around his ankle as he went in because in case he was struck dead in the presence of God, they could drag him out. I mean, how, how frightening would that be? So all these barriers. Now, Jesus breathes his last. It is finished. And the temple, is the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. I mean, we can only imagine what that must have been like. What does that mean? We know what that means. All you have to do is read the book of Hebrews where it unpacks. That's in the New Testament. It unpacks the whole meaning of the temple being ripped apart, curtain. For one thing, we know it means the end of temple religion. Because that ripped curtain, and then the 40 year later, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, showed that no longer do we come to a temple to worship Jesus, because Jesus is the temple. He's the place where we find our way to God. And because he is the one who ripped that curtain, he's showing us that we now have open access to God, all of us, no barriers, no barriers because you're a woman, no barriers because you're a Gentile. We all have open access now to God through Christ. Now, I know Hollywood likes to make movies, Bible movies, okay? And they always embellish things. And the Son of God is no different. One thing that was frustrating to me in that movie was that not once but twice they quoted John 14, verse 6, in part. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, period. I thought, whoa, give the rest of the verse, which says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When that curtain was torn from top to bottom, Jesus was saying, I'm the way in. I'm the way to God. You see that? You talk about the acceptance that we have now. I mean, we tend to be people who understand performance. We, gotta, we have performance reviews at work. We have to live up to all these expectations. It's always do, 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 do. And sometimes that infiltrates into our Christian faith, and we think we've got to do these things for God to get merit from Him. And then suffering comes, and we think, God, what are you doing? I've been doing my part. How come you're not doing your part? It's all messed up. Because when that curtain was torn, it was God saying, it is finished. You are not on a merit system. Some of us uh, become Christians and think, okay, we're saved by grace, but now it's up to me to work hard for God, and we're always feeling guilty. Oh, I didn't have a quiet time today. I didn't witness to somebody today. We're all bound up with guilt. Jesus says, I've ripped the curtain. I've open the door. There's free access to God. It's total acceptance because I was rejected and forsaken. Do you see that? So that our life in God is no longer, I'm trying to win points with Him, having received the gift of forgiveness through the open curtain of the tent into Jesus. I can serve out of joy and appreciation and gratitude rather than duty and merit. This is so freeing. When God looks at us, He does not look with us in anger. He looks at us with love because of the acceptance that we have in Christ. This is powerful truth. Now, earthquakes are amazing things. They had an earthquake out in Los Angeles recently, and my brother lives there, and so I called him. I said, Rick, he's on his birthday. I, were you okay? 
He says, well, you know, I work in Hollywood. He does. He, and, he, and, he, and he says, I was in my office in one of these trailers, you know, with the rubber tires. And he said, the earthquake hit. And he says, when you start to roll around, you know, fortunately, I had rubber tires under me. <laughs> he said, you dive for the desk. I mean, that, it's got to be quite a thing. But when that earthquake came simultaneously to the ripping of the curtain, it also did some other things, like split rocks and opened tombs. Now, I love the way that uh, Matthew puts it, and I think the English Standard Version has translated, interpreted it correctly. It talks about the tombs being opened, and then after Jesus was raised from the dead three days later, these people came out of the tombs. We think, and there's so many questions here. What in the world? It, it, when I first read this as a teenager, I thought, zombies. This is before zombies were popular. This looks like zombies. I mean, tombs open, people walking around. Scary. But that's not what happened. Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, evidently these Old Testament saints, and saints is not in the Roman Catholic sense of people that we pray to. Saints just means people who are believers. These Old Testament saints came walking through. And, oh, I have so many questions when I get to heaven to ask God, you know, what in the world? Did they go into town? Did they sit down and have lunch with somebody? Uh, when did they leave? Did they, did they ascend with Jesus when he was uh, ascended into heaven? I don't know. But what we do know is Matthew said that when Jesus breathed his last, there was an earthquake, the temple was torn, the temple curtain was torn, and dead people came to life when he was resurrected. The Apostle Paul comments on this in a helpful way in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, going back to Genesis 3, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So I, we think Christ was raised first as the first fruits. These other folks were raised too, and people saw them. Now, when we look at these things, we realize that the Christian faith alone, among all the religions of the world, teaches a wonderful view of eternal life. So many religions teach when you're dead, you're dead. Or when you're dead, you come back as another creature. Reincarnation. Christianity alone says when Jesus died and rose again, he was showing us that we will have real bodies when we get to heaven. Real bodies. The, the trumpet will blast, the dead in Christ will be raised, and we will have a great reunion. I think of this every time we do a funeral service and I'm praying for the family at the graveside. I just revel. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. In that one act, Jesus defeated sin, hell, and death. And it really happened. I mean, if we took this stuff seriously, what impact would it have on us? Imagine yourself in pain and deterioration, chronic illness, and the doctor says, you only have two weeks to live. None of us looks forward to the process of death. We may even fear it. But the hope of eternal life in God is for us Christians something that moves us, motivates us, changes our priorities. Now, who witnessed these things? Well, we know the bystanders, the Jewish bystanders were, eh, let Elijah come and get him. Don't give him any wine to... So, I mean, it's kind of amazing that the, the Jewish leaders were seeing the same things as the Roman soldiers and the women, but they looked at it and didn't get it. But we learn in this third section that there were witnesses that did get it. Witnesses of grace. First of all, the centurion, that's a Roman soldier overseeing 100 soldiers, and some of his fellow soldiers saw what Jesus did, heard what Jesus said, witnessed the earthquake and the darkness, and came to this conclusion. Whoa! He is the Son of God. Now, we don't know how 
clearly they understood his messianic role. But we do know they became believers at that point. We think they became believers. They saw what Jesus had done. They heard what he said. And they said, he is the Son of God. It's ironic that the good religious Bible-believing people were not getting it, and pagan Gentile Roman soldiers that worshiped Caesar were seeing the truth. Isn't it something how we can stand at the foot of the cross and miss it? It happens even in Cedar Rapids. Good Bible-believing people who come to church every Sunday don't get it. It's people that don't feel like they're worthy to come to church that all of a sudden see grace and it makes sense. And then the women. And it mentions the women's names. Here's another reason we believe this is true. It really happened. If you were talking about the founder of a religion, would you pick people that were perceived by that culture as undependable witnesses? Did you know that a woman could not even testify in a law court because she was judged undependable? Women had a very low view in that society. And yet here are the gospel writers, all of them, saying that when the men ran away, the women were loyal to the end. They loved Jesus. He treated them with respect. He appreciated their ministry to him, and they were committed. We'll find out when we get to the resurrection. They were the first ones at the tomb. People perceived as undependable and weak. When I was a teenager, I just felt like I was an outcast. I felt like I didn't fit in. I compared myself with my fellow students most of whom it seemed like were taller, faster, better athletes, better students. I looked up to people that were on the debate team because they could be confident enough to do it. I didn't feel comfortable. I was so bashful. Uh, I couldn't believe that some of my fellow students actually had a clear complexion when I had pimples. It just, it just didn't seem as if I fit anywhere. I didn't fit at church. The cool kids were at church, and I didn't fit, feel like I fit in there. But when I came to these stories of Jesus in the New Testament and saw that it was the outcasts, the Gentiles, and the women, and I thought of 1 Corinthians 1 that says, God has not chosen the strong and the smart. God has chosen the foolish things, the foolish people of this world, through whom to work his power and might. That gave me such hope as a teenager. It affected the way I think, the decisions I make. Do you see the impact here? The religious in crowd didn't get it. But the outcasts did. Hallelujah. How many people come into churches? I don't think I'm good enough to be here. I, someday I'm going to get it done. I'm going to put a big sign up there. No perfect people allowed. Because these are the ones that Jesus gave eyes to see the truth. Oh, my friends, do you see it? I love how the newsboys said it. What a great song. I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. I'm accepted. He was condemned. I'm alive. His spirit lives within me because he died and rose again. My friends, do you see the truth of this? As you put yourself with the witnesses, would you say you're more like the religious people? Oh, you know a lot about the Bible, but you don't understand grace. Or would you say, yes, I'm with the soldiers. I'm coming from paganism to believing. Or are you with the women? Loyal to Jesus in the end. I know where I want to be. How about you? Christ suffered the darkness of a forsaken soul, ripped the temple curtain to accept us, and allows witnesses like foolish people, you and me, to come into his kingdom and enjoy the fruits 
of his resurrection power. You want to say amen to that? Let's stand, shall we? Father, thank you so much. You are an amazing God. Forgive us for our blind eyes. Forgive us for our complacency. Forgive us for missing it. Open our eyes that we can see. Open our eyes, Lord, to who you really are, that even in the most difficult days of suffering, you are there. And your acceptance takes us off the performance track. We want to be your witnesses, Lord. So come in the power of your Holy Spirit and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't that a great truth? Satan, you know, ah, you're a guilty sinner. Upward I look and see him there who made an end and forgave me. Uh, we have a three-minute guideline here. We'd like you to talk with somebody you don't know. If you find out they're new to our church, you might want to walk with them to the, sta the Starting Point Cafe and uh, point them in the right direction if they'd like to attend that event. And um, let's just take some time to show the love of Christ to each other. I know this is tough for us introverts. Uh, we feel much more uh, comfortable with the people we know, but uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to show the love of Christ to each other. So take three minutes, and then I'm going to stick around up here. If you, uh, you know, we have two red roses in a vase from, or is it three? Two. Uh, two people who crossed the line of faith and trusted in Jesus as their Savior. You may want to do that today. You say, I want to know this Christ who died for me and rose again. I'm going to stick around up here. We have other leaders around. We'd love to talk with you. So thank you for coming. May the Lord bless you, and may you be encouraged this week as you go out in his strength. Amen.